Hey gang, this is Justin Croxton here from Propellant Media. Um, there are a number of, I mean, there's checks, checklists for days that are out there um, for, you know, developing a campaign within the Google Ads platform. And, you know, I mean, once, you, once you've become sort of initiated in the process, um, you, you do get to a point where you don't kind of need a checklist. You just kind of know what to do. It's like secondhand nature. Um, but this is a pretty good one that we use here internally uh, here at Propellant Media. Um, and so, I mean, there's a couple ways to look at this. First, you can look at it from the perspective of developing a campaign, particularly in search. And we're not talking so much about uh, the display campaigns themselves, but if you're talking about just search in general, then we have a portion of the checklist that you know helps solve that. But then we also have a checklist for just some standard optimizations. Um, there, there's a number of other things that we do um, from an optimization perspective, whether it be, you know, developing scripts so that, you know, the system can uh, optimize itself, you know, alerts that you can set up, all really cool things that you can do within the platform. But for the sake of everyone that's out there, you know, I really want to try to keep this punchy and to the point as much as I possibly can. And so for, for a second, imagine that you were developing uh, a pay-per-click advertising campaign for yourself. And it was for a client, maybe it was for your own organization, whatever it may be. Uh, th these are the standard practices that if you, if you use this from a launch perspective, you're going to win just about every single time. Um, this helps reduce at least 50 to 75% of the waste on the front end of a campaign. It helps you, you know, gives you to put you to a place where you can actually spot check any errors or performance of your campaigns as a whole. Really, really good stuff that, that we try to go through. And so let me, uh, I'll talk about this for a second and you'll kind of see where I'm coming from. Um, when, when you're thinking about a campaign, a campaigns are, or any Google search campaign is broken out into about four different layers. The first is the campaign itself. The second would be the ad group. We'll talk about that. The third would be the text or the ad copy. And the fourth would be the keyword strategy. So this is the checklist that we use here internally at Propellant Media. I mean, it's not a perfect system, but I'd say it works for at least 60 to 70% of campaigns that we develop uh, for clients across the board. So here are the best practices. Um, hear me out, and I think you'll appreciate this. The first, when it comes to at the campaign level, I want you guys to really focus on um, going into the campaign settings and look at these different things. For example, you only want to have one product or service per campaign. So if you're running a campaign or running several campaigns for a client, let's say a client is a personal injury attorney, you know, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, lump all of their, you know, keywords that's related to, you know, being an attorney within just, um, how do I say this within just one particular campaign, maybe they do trucking accidents, maybe they do car accidents, maybe they do motorcycle accidents, those could realistically be three separate campaigns, right, and ultimately three separate themes. And so you always want to look at them from that perspective, when you're sort of developing your campaign, that's the first thing we focus on. Second, we also like to look at the ad scheduling. So, you know, if you're really focused on leads and leads that you're trying to generate during certain times of the day, you don't want to have the campaign running, you know, after 7 or 7 p.m. or something along those lines. So we really try to make sure that that's been set up properly. A lot of times we'll have clients and we'll notice that they've set up when we do some audits for folks. We'll notice that they have set up uh, a campaign that includes display select, which is a no, no, when you first start a campaign. And they'll even have search partners network set up. That too is not a good idea in most cases. If you start with the search network, which is primarily those individuals that go directly to the, uh, the Google platform to do a search, that's more than sufficient. And then if you want to expand from there over into the search partners network, you can certainly do that. But I do that with caution and I do that with the perspective that you should have conversion tracking set up. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But when you're first starting your campaigns, Focus on the search network. Don't do anything within search partners and, and never start with um, display select. Next, we like to uh, split our ads evenly. I think nowadays with responsive text ads, you possibly don't really need to do that as much. Um, so if you have two or three responsive ads, then maybe that does make sense. But 
you know, it's still a nice thing to do in certain instances. So if you want to do it, you certainly can. It's not going to hurt, but it can certainly provide you with some good intelligence if you are split testing several different ads, you know, ad copy, if you will. Location targeting. This is a big one. A lot of times people, um, there's a, a certain place um, within location targeting where you can check off the actual location of individuals that may, may, they may not even live in that area, but they're searching in that area. So if I live in Philadelphia, but I'm doing a search in, in, in California, you know, I might type in the word, you know, California, you know, personal injury attorneys, but I can, I can pull up that search if I'm in Philadelphia, if I have that, that, that button checked off within the uh, location targeting settings within the campaign itself, you only want to reach people who are in that location. And, and just so I'm, so everyone's sort of clear on what I'm talking about here, uh, let's see here. Just want to give everyone the stylized example because this stuff really, 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 really matters. So if you come over here to settings, come on, come on, there we go. If you come over here to settings, and then you scroll down to this guy right here, presence. You want to only target people in or regular in your targeted locations. You don't want to target people who express an interest in your targeted location. That's usually a recommendation, even for individuals that are targeting folks all around the United States. It just really helps with the waste. We've noticed that across the board. We highly, highly suggest that. Next, your bid strategy. Um, usually starting off, we do make it a, a max cost per click bid. We, we usually range it anywhere from 10 to 15, 20 bucks, depending on the, uh, you know, the competition within the market, but usually we'll start there, but you have to have your conversion tracking set up, whether you're tracking phone calls, you know, form submissions, whatever you need to have something, some sort of a conversion, micro conversions versus macro conversions. You got to have conversion tracking set up so that eventually you can switch to a maximized conversion strategy then possibly a CPA bid strategy and maybe even a ROAS uh, bid strategy as well. Very, very important. And then last but not least, you really want, you, you really want your naming conventions to be proper. You, you want them to make sense. You want to give yourself the space when you're looking at reporting to be able to spot check performance at the campaign level a lot, a lot faster. This really makes a difference long term and uh, helps uh, speed up your, your, your time to you know, look at things um, and analyze the data and the performance across your campaign. So Campaign settings, that's usually what we're looking at. I mean, there's a number of other things, but this is like a real quick stylized example. Then at the ad group level, we have two different ways in which we build ad groups here at our agency at Propellant Media. The first are what we call SCAGs, those are single keyword ad groups. This has been a really powerful strategy, um, particularly that knowing that Google has made it more difficult for us to determine which keywords are producing the highest, the best fruit for our clients. I mean, they haven't, that hasn't been removed altogether, but when we're spot checking campaigns, we're able to see stuff in a much more quicker fashion um, and make optimizations a whole lot faster and improve the overall performance of, a cam of our campaigns where we're doing what's called single keyword ad groups. That's when you have a keyword per ad group versus putting 10, 20, 30, 40 keywords in one ad group. So that's really helpful. But then there are certain cases where like, if we're running a brand campaign, then we might actually just, you know, build one ad group or two ad groups and we'll put a lot of the brand terms within that one ad group. Or if we're really trying to go with a particular theme, we don't, and there's not a lot of keywords to go with, we may still utilize five to 10 keywords within that one ad group itself. In those cases, I think it's fine. But if you're dealing with 50, 60, 70 or more keywords, and I think single keyword ad groups in thematic, um, specifically in thematic uh, campaign infrastructures, I think it really does matter at that point. So now that you've gone through your campaign settings and your ad group, um, development, then you're able to put your responsive text ads um, within your ad groups effectively. So responsive text ads, usually we would do uh, three to four extended text ads, but by the time you know folks have listened to this, um, the extended text ads are probably going to be removed. And so I'm just going to delete this all together. And then in this case, you can focus on one to two um, responsive ads, um, responsive text ads per ad group. Sometimes we'll use what's called keyword insertion as well. Um, that that kind of helps with click-through rates from time to time. We do like to utilize that. 
Um, for those who don't know responsive ads, responsive ads are where you are given the opportunity to insert 15 headlines for descriptions. And, you know, the, the Google system will just find the permutations that's going to, you know, perform the best for you. Um, we typically recommend at least 10 headlines and that you fill out all four description lines with some great variation, some call to actions, um, some, 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 um, uh, some, some responsive text ads that includes the keywords that you're going after really, really makes a difference um, uh, from a performance standpoint. Some of the other things that we have in our checklist, we'll look at all of the extensions that we can utilize. Um, we'll look at the call extensions. We'll look at call outs, image extensions. If that feature has been turned on within your Google Ads account, structured snippets, site links, location extensions. Um, and then also we'll utilize what's called dynamic uh, image extensions as well, where you can actually dynamically pull images directly from your site um, that gets pulled into your ads as well. Really helps with the overall um, performance um, of your campaigns and your click-through rates. I was talking about ad copy already, but I'll talk about it one more time. Um, the, the one thing that we really try to do is we try to get client buy-in. Um, we don't just simply build the ads ourselves. Clients have so much more context than us. But the one thing that I will say, it's really nice when you can include numbers, you can get pricing, you know, you know, you know, having an ad that's customized um, when needed um, really makes a difference. Having quotation marks, things that just um, how do I say this? Things that will draw the eyes to your ad really makes a difference. Those benefits of your product or your service that you're trying to promote really makes a difference. And then last but not least, um, we try to have our ad copy not be sentence cased. We really try to have it be title case. So what that means is that you're going to have the first letter of each word is going to be capitalized. It's just a much more professional look within your ad copy. You'll notice that within a lot of um, 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 uh, video ads that you might see out there really, really is clean and also it just looks better visually. So we always go with that, that approach. And so as part of our checklist is we're as we've built a campaign and we're spot checking a campaign after the fact, um, then we get to our keyword strategy. I, I know here as part of our checklist, we say 50 to 100 keywords. That's not always going to be the case. And you don't that hasn't doesn't always have to be, you know, the, the perfect standard. But it is important to have a good number of keywords as long as they are absolutely relevant to the brand and the services that you're promoting. And the other thing to note is that if you, as I was talking about the, uh, the personal injury attorney example, you might have three different uh, campaigns, one that's for truckers, one that's for car accidents, one that's for motorcycles, and then you can actually develop 20 to 30 keywords per each campaign. That too is okay. Um, and so, you know, next thing, you know, we typically like to go with phrase and exact match only. Um, you know, Google lately has really been pushing folks to go with broad match and they use their their smart bidding strategy um i i've done that too many times and tested this theory out too many times and their argument is that they're able to target the user rather than just the keyword itself um, that that can translate into you know a good conversion for your brand but in our experience um, the cost per actions go up quite a bit even if um, it's generating it's still generating leads um, also, you have to be incredibly diligent in adding a ton of negative keywords on a regular basis. I've seen it just too many times. It doesn't work as well. So always start with phrase and exact match. Never start with broad match. Um, when implementing, if you're implementing a cost per click bid strategy, I said big, <laughs> bid strategy, initially always bid exact match 50 cents higher than your phrase match to start with. Um, it's just a standard practice. We like to go with that approach typically. Um, as a strategy, um, you know, once you've found all your terms through the Google Keyword Planner, you need to mark off the ones that you want to use. So sometimes we got we know folks out there that will kind of be lazy and they'll just download a ton of keywords from Google Keyword Planner and they won't. I mean, they'll just download all the keywords and they'll use that as their keyword list. Don't do that. Download the keyword list. Have a clear understanding of the business and the client that you're working with and click off, like literally pick handpick all of the keywords that's relevant and build them out into separate themes relative to the products and services that your client or, or that your own brand is, um, is promoting. Um, it's just a much cleaner and effective way to ensure that you're not starting off with a ton of waste within your campaigns. Next, 
um, you know, once you've done all of that, you know, take that same keyword list and send that to your internal team, send that to your client so you can get their buy in. Um, cause the last thing, I mean, if you get, you think about it, the keywords is are that is your audience, essentially those keywords represent your audience. And if in marketing, if you get the audience wrong, everything else, you're just wasting money at that point. So if you get buy-in from the client, that gives you the ability to ensure that you're not, you know, wasting as much ad spend. I give you a great example, you know, we're working with a client, a spray foam insulation company. And if you think about it, you can offer the service of spray foam insulation, but there's also a lot of products that are out there. And there's also people that are just trying to do sort of a DIY product, you know, DIY foam insulation themselves. And so you can imagine that you don't want to show up for the word product spray foam insulation or spray foam insulation Home Depot or DIY spray foam insulation. You only want to show up for people that are saying spray foam insulation near me, spray foam insulation service or service companies. You got to look at it contextually from that perspective. And if you do, you're going to you're going to win more times than not. Um, as part of our checklist, we're also looking at the negative keyword strategy. So you want to add a lot of keywords on the front end. We have a really extensive list that we can share with everybody um, uh, if you ask for it. Um, but we have a ton of negative keywords that are broken out into like people that are looking for jobs, people that are looking for different careers, you know, DIYers, you know, price, you know, a lot, of, you know, city states, a lot of different keywords that you can add as negatives to ensure that you're getting as much waste out of it on the front end as possible. Um, and then one thing that we'll double check is we like to leverage um, sort of just an overall negative keyword list that we may be able to use across multiple campaigns. And so when we're building out our negative keyword list, you know, we're saving that as a negative keyword list itself so that we can use that across multiple campaigns that we may be building out for a client long term. And then last but not least, um, conversion tracking setup. Um, you know, if you don't have Google Tag Manager, you know, it's, it's a lifesaver. Have it installed on a client's website. If you don't have, if a client's really trying to measure phone calls, you know, having a, a software like CallRail um, installed really does help you measure phone calls. But the bottom line is you must absolutely have call tracking or, excuse me, conversion tracking set up, period. It's an absolute must. Um, I don't care whether you're measuring leads, application, phone calls, something. I mean, even if it's a critical button clicks, micro conversions, you got to have something set up. Because if you don't, you can't move to a max conversions bid strategy, a CPA bid strategy, a ROAS bid strategy. You can't do any of those things. Um, and so, you know, in doing so, um, you know, at the very, very least, um, if you are measuring phone calls, then you can at least have um, your call extension set up. Um, so you can measure individuals that have called, you know, one of your call extensions as an example. And so, you know, there's a problem. There's certainly a number of other things that I'm missing here, but these are like, this covers 80% of the work that you would have to do from a, from a foundational infrastructure perspective for any of your Google ads campaigns. And honestly, after spot checking, you know, then, you know, you launch your campaign again, this is just talking about search campaigns. We're not talking about display or YouTube video campaigns, just search. And so once you've gone through that process, now you can move over to, OK, I've launched my campaign. Now you can spend the first week to two weeks really optimizing it. And, and typically, you know, we're, we'll talk about it in a separate uh, conversation, but we're, we're usually in the campaigns about two to three times a day um, in the first week. And then it sort of trickles out from there. But we're still maintaining a level of consistency. Um, because sometimes clients will want to build out new campaigns. They want, we want to make certain that certain campaigns aren't competing against each other. And so, you know, this is a checklist that, that we use. Um, I mean, we have one that's a lot more extensive, it's a lot more extensive than this, but this is, this is like, this is gold right here. I'm telling you right now. So I hope this was helpful, everyone. Thanks for taking the time. Greatly appreciate it. And, uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll talk to you all soon.